And I'm going to introduce today's uh, presenter for the ULVLC, who's Megan Carlton, our science librarian. And Megan's going to be giving us an introduction to citizen science. Um, I asked Megan to do this because I know uh, that she is kind of an expert on this concept, and I really don't know very much about it. And I thought there would be some interest in it, and I was right to be the people signed up. So um, with all of that said, um, you know, if y'all have any tech issues, please feel free to use the chat. I'm going to keep an eye on it and um, just, you know, let me know if anything is coming up. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to turn things over to Megan. I'm going to, I'm going to mute myself and stop my video um, for now and let Megan take it away. Awesome. Well, I'm Megan. I'm the science librarian at UNC Greensboro. Okay, and I think two of you maybe came to our social event where I talked about iNaturalist a lot. Um, and this is an app that, um, well, for citizen scientists or people who want, who are interested in nature and interested in, you know, kind of being a naturalist in their own little uh, neighborhood or backyard. It's, it's very useful for that, but it also contributes to um, science uh, kind of in a larger aspect also. But I realized when we were going through iNaturalist that, you know, I didn't really give a lot of background of just what citizen science is and, you know, some different um, there's there's more things than just biodiversity, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. So maybe you'll have some ideas um, if you're a liaison. There are other ways other than the STEM fields to include citizen science in classes. Um, and even if you're not and you're just interested, um, there are things beyond biodiversity. But since that's what I like, that's what I talk about a lot. Okay, so into it. What is citizen science? So according to Webster, uh, citizen science is just scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration with or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions. But more simply, it's just public participation in scientific research. Um, I won't go a lot into, you know, there's been some discussion about changing the term from citizen science to community science, but community science is a very specific um, thing under the umbrella of citizen science. So there's still talk going on about it. Um, so it might change in the future, but um, really it's, it's so much more than just this participating in scientific research. Um, it's an invitation for everyone to participate in real science on topics that they care about. So this uh, public participation in research is not new. It, um, I'm just going to tell you about a couple of them to keep it brief. But basically in the 1880s, um, lighthouse keepers began collecting data about bird strikes um, as long as, yeah, in, in the 1880s. I'm sorry. Whew. I should have had coffee, but it's too late for that. Um, so then the Audubon um, Society started the annual Christmas bird count in 1900. And so this, they just asked um, participants to keep track of birds that they saw around Christmas time. I think it's about a week or so that they asked people to track just what birds that they saw in their backyard. And so even data from this very first bird count is still um, really helpful to scientists today because they're able to see, you know, what um, migration patterns were back then and if they've changed at all. Um, so 1992, the NSF funded a series of projects through Cornell called Public Participation in Ornithology, um, which is the study of birds. And that's still going on today um, in a lot of different um, ways, a lot of different projects. So any, but all around birds. So if you're interested in birds, Cornell has some amazing projects um, that you can get involved in. So what does citizen science look like today? Um, this can take, like I said, tons of different forms, but I am going to ask you to participate in one of these projects. So this is one of my absolute favorites. I'm going to ask you to minimize this presentation. And Jenny, if you wanted to pause the um, recording, you can do that. 
and that way people don't have like blank time in the recording. So a camera trap, um, has anybody used these for hunting or to see what's in their backyard? Yeah, so it's a, a camera, a digital camera that you can put anywhere. Yeah, um, my parents actually have one that they have strapped to a tree in their backyard. Um, and hunters will use these a lot of times is I guess where they first kind of started out. And anytime there's movement, the camera will take several pictures and that way you can get those kind of um, pictures in order. It makes it easier to see movement. Um, and then it stores up on a little SD card and then um, the scientists or hunters can come back and see what kind of animals are living in that area. Um, but yeah, Audrey, these are great that it's not disruptive. You're not having to have people out there kind of looking, you know, bothering animals and stuff like that. Plus, are the animals even going to show up if there's a scientist there, you know, trying to record who's around? Um, any other comments about maybe some ways that this is good for um, ecologists and scientists? Feel free to pick up your mic. <laughs> Yeah, and locate species. It's definitely easy for them to track and say, you know, are there any foxes left in the world? Well, yeah, we just got pictures of them. What's um what's possible downfall of this? Yeah, <laughs> the pictures aren't perfect. Um, yeah, that's right. We are not experts, but. Yeah, oh, Darren Lee, great. Human privacy issues. So I'm definitely um, a UNCG wetland scientist is, you know, they have cameras in the wetlands and they often have pictures of, you know, college kids or other people urinating and showing their privates to the cameras because they don't know they're there. Um, so yeah, some technology issues also. But the big, <laughs> so the big problem with these though is, and the biggest problem, all those are, they, they definitely are, um, but it's the amount of data that they are producing. So the amount of data with these, with these cameras taking so many pictures every day, you know, they're, it's hard for scientists to actually do anything with them. In the past, when they would, even when they would set out these cameras, um, if a scientist was studying elephants, they would only pick out the pictures that had elephants in them and the rest of those would get thrown away. And so now we have the ability, if we can process it, to look at a lot of different species instead of just the one um, that the scientist is, is concentrating on. Um, so it's really been, you know, a game changer as far as ecological research, um, yes, and even hunting and wildlife viewing, but also things like nest ecology and detection of rare species, and they can estimate population, spot, population size and species richness, um, as well as do research on habitat use and occupation of human built structures. So, you know, even in New York City, they have a lot of cameras um, on nesting sites of the hawks and falcons that live in New York City so they can keep an eye on them. Um, and yeah, like we said, um, because they're non-invasive and they're easy to operate, um, they don't really require a lot of training. They're an excellent tool for um, citizen scientists and even undergraduate researchers um, that can kind of provide research opportunities for them. And then that data that's collected can be used for, you know, within real research and analysis. Um, let's see, but again, so we're kind of limited by this human processing capacity. Um, and even, you know, even getting non subject experts to classify the images where they might be wrong. If you think about one scientist going through and analyzing each one of these pictures, if they miss one or if they get one wrong, that's it. There's no going back. So even by using non-experts, by using a bunch of them, they actually become more accurate than scientists do. And they're, again, really good at 
kind of uh, uh, processing these large data sets. So Snapshot Serengeti, the one that we just did, that all of you now participated in a citizen science project, um, is also providing a lot of case studies in how to engage citizen scientists, um, and especially in conservation monitoring. Okay, so again, I'm sorry, I do a lot about biodiversity because that's what I love, but there are a lot of different types of projects. Um, hang on just one second. Okay, so there are four main types of projects so far. So citizen science is still growing. Um, and so a lot of this can change and I'm sure that we will see a lot of different types of projects emerge as technology evolves. Um, but web-based projects are just that. They can be done completely online, such as camera trap projects and many others. They don't require participants to go into the field or to leave their computer. Um, and the platform that we were just on, it, Zooniverse, contains only these types of projects so far. So these projects are designed to appeal to kind of the widest range of volunteers and are typically asking you to do just simple tasks so they can process large amounts of data. So the other side of that, there are also field-based projects um, in which the researcher relies on data that's collected by participants. So uh, a naturalist is one of these where they ask you to go out and take pictures and then you're submitting to the pictures to um, this platform and scientists can use the pictures and the information that you submit. So this, uh, the projects range from collecting and analyzing water and soil samples, um, taking measurements, pictures, it could even be sound clips, um, monitoring urban areas, uh, even growing mold in your home um, and really this, these types of projects are only limited by the people who are developing them their imagination because they they can look very different um, but they also require attention to collection protocols and kind of best practices um, for participants and that way the scientists can ensure data quality and so community engaged research projects and there is a reason there's a pig on here. It's not just a random pig, um, but these are driven by scientists or a research team that engages the community to help develop research questions, design a study and collect data. The goal of these types of projects is to address a community concern through collaborative research and to translate the research findings into public health action that benefits the community. Um, so the reason the pig is there is, uh, oh, what was the name of that project? The Community Health Effects of Industrial Hog Operations Projects. It's kind of long, um, but basically there's a community here in North Carolina that developed a project with researchers at Chapel Hill to address the smell and waste concerns from living near industrial hog farms. Um, the researchers uh, developed a way to track smell at various locations for months and then built a case about environmental regulations around the farms. The Community Health Effects of Industrial Hog Operations Project found that rural communities of color are over three times more likely to live within three miles of industrial hog farms compared to white communities, as well as numerous public health concerns that needed to be addressed. Projects like these can assist community, communities in uh, policy development and change within their communities, as well as provide research opportunities for scientists. So the last type of project are citizen science games. So these leverage the ability of users to solve, sorry, to solve pubs, puzzles and can range from finding the best trajectory in a city with traffic, um, to identifying genes, to folding proteins, um, and the one pictured here is in the bottom right is iWire, and that one participants map 3D structures of neurons within the brain. Um, this one, there's a little bit of a learning curve on, on how to figure out exactly what to do, um, but there's an extensive tutorial and training along with the games before they kind of turn you loose. So, some other types of projects, um, 
since again, I want y'all to know there's way more than biodiversity and ecology. Um, so here's some other examples. So the, the top left is a spectrogram from the Gravity Spy Project that is studying ripples in space time. So it shows kind of a glitch in which a signal uh, which is a signal that can hinder the search for gravitational waves um, and classifying these glitches is being used to train a machine machine learning algorithms to spot the glitches and allow human intuition to kind of classify those abnormal glitches. Um, so the next picture we're going to go, I guess, clockwise um, is from the power to the people project. Um, in which participants are asked to draw boxes around possible homes and buildings on satellite images in order to find rural homes in Africa to expand ele electrical access. Uh, the top right is an example from the Anti-Slavery Manuscripts Project in which handwritten correspondence between anti-slavery activists in the 19th century are being transcribed by volunteers. And there's a ton of these because um, I guess computers have problems reading uh, cursive from the 19th century. So there's a lot of projects like that. Um, so the bottom right is the Fishing in the Past Project uh, and they're learning about bio, sorry, biodiversity again, but this one is including history, um, the history of our culture by looking at the use of fish in the past. Um, so participants look at paintings from the 16th to 19th century, and they just identify whether or not there are fish in the painting that could be used by scientists to recognize a specific species. And then in the bottom left, the Penguin Watch, Watch Project, um, in, Gauges participants to understand uh, penguin population changes, behaviors, and timing of breeding. So since I've mentioned it a couple of times, one of the most popular nature apps, iNaturalist, um, helps you identify plants and animals that are around you. Um, and then once you record these observations, you can help create kind of quality data for scientists um, to track, you know, migration patterns or seasonal changes in um, just your everyday plants and animals around you. Let's see. Ah. So one of the things that they're really good at is engaging their volunteers in a lot of different projects. Um, if you sign up for iNaturalist, these are just some of the projects that you can get involved in. Let's see, I'm trying not to cover too much of what I already did last time because I know Patrick and Audrey and maybe even Darren Lee might be bored to tears, but they frequently host these city nature challenges. Um, the one this year uh, just ran for three days, but sometimes you can find ones that run a little longer. Um, the, the Randolph County Biothon ran for several months and your colleague, Megan, actually won that one, got first place in Randolph County. But we were also competing against other counties in the area, which we did not win. And it was just to see who could take the most pictures of um, plants and animals in the in their area. Um, but some other projects, if you sign up for this, they have an app, or you can do it on your computer. You can sign up. Um, you can see which projects are available around you locally. Um, so over here on the left is just a screenshot of some of the projects that are nearby. And so once you take these pictures, they use the same crowdsourced approach as they do in Snapshot Serengeti. I mean, they're asking other people to identify these animals. So if you don't know, it's okay. You don't have to be afraid that you're going to get it wrong because other people will definitely come behind you and say, wait, wait, no, no, that was this animal and here's why. Um, so this can also help people learn about the different species in their areas. Let's see, has anybody, where did my chat go? Has anybody since the iNaturalist uh, presentation that I did, have, have y'all started taking pictures on there? Have you gotten anything good? Okay, I guess not. Okay, so 
Nothing very exciting. Oh, the robber fly, Audrey. Did you know what it was when you found a picture of it? You can pick up your mic. <laughs> yeah, those things are really- Pick up the mic, you mean unmute myself. There you go. Um, I, was at, I was at a friend's and we were like, what is that? So the picture and then I put it on iNaturalist and then it's like, oh, what are some suggestions for this? So that yeah. I know, it's perfect. People will start coming to you now that they know you can figure that out. And they'll be like, what is this animal? And you say, no, it's an app. <laughs> Anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but yeah, so by doing this, though, you know, you're not only, you know, satisfying your own curiosity and trying to figure out what these animals are, you're also contributing to research. Um, so, again, I keep saying they are tracking a lot of migration data and things like that. Um, but you can easily look up other um, projects and research papers that have come out of these projects. It's very interesting. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about, and then I want to explore a little bit more is SciStarter. So this is kind of the go-to place for finding a project that you're interested in. And oh, actually, let's go and see the actual site. Hang on just a second. Let me switch around. Not that one. Oh my goodness, why am I having issues like I've never used? There we go. Okay, so this is SciStarter. Um, it's been funded by numerous grants to create this site and they have done an amazing job at kind of putting together all of these projects. Um, so with that, they sometimes don't get updated when a project is no longer active. So don't get married to one that you see right off the bat because you might get into it and realize that um, they're no longer working on that project or it's completed, but there are many, many others. Um, so let's see, there's a great little just simple search, but since we work in a library that won't do, we have to go to advanced searching. And our project finder here, does anybody want to throw out something that they might be interested in, a topic, anything? My chat box is gone again. Okay, somebody give me something that they want to work on. You want to do a local wildflowers, perfect. Okay, so we can search for wildflowers and Jenny or anybody else, do we want to do the project only online or do we want to go outside and do it? <laughs> okay, let's do, let's do something that we can do on a lunch break because we can, or on a walk, on a walk. And we can go and find our projects. So there are several of them. And since this was not something completely online, it's given us some stuff in some different areas. Let's look at what this mountain watch is. Awesome, at least it's kind of close. So it'll give you kind of an overview of what that project is and then the ideal age limits for these projects. Some of them may be a little too hard for elementary school kids to do, but if you're working with elementary students, um, it's definitely good to have um, that limiter in there where you can say, no, I only want elementary school stuff. But it'll take you to their website also. So if it's outside of SciStarter, it'll tell you that it's outside of this. Uh-oh, okay, and so that one we might have to dig around a little bit more for, because again, it's not updated. Can you back up, please? Okay, so let's refresh. Where's my chat? Let's find another topic. Morgan, what would you be interested in doing? 
what kind of project? Okay, she's not gonna tell me. So I will pick animals because that's what I'm interested in. Let's animals. do birds. Animals. Okay. Animals. We're gonna do birds. Animals. And this time we're gonna go only online. So we can limit it and say, can only be done online. And then there's a ton of projects that you can do from your computer, um, which is great. I'm trying to find one. We can also pick some that are SciStarter affiliates let's see where is it oh there we go size starter affiliates so these are projects that are working more closely with size starter apparently there are none with birds oh my gosh child you're distracting okay so these projects can if a professor or somebody wants to assign some of these in a class, they'll actually be able to keep track of um, kind of how much participation they have done. So this is really a really good way for if, um, if they're assigned to do like 300 classifications or spend four hours kind of working on a project, if you do one that's affiliated with SciStarter, they can keep track for you. So like this one is good for families, graduate students and adults. So maybe students uh, may not be able to do this one all on their own. Check your email for instructions. Oh my gosh. Does anybody have any questions or anything they want me to kind of show you how to do or talk about a little more? And my chat again. Megan, what's one of your favorite projects? Ooh, favorite projects. Oh, a snapshot Serengeti. Uh, not only because that's a good one that I can do with my family, like we can sit and go through and kind of, you know, see animals in a different country, um, but also the, the research that they've done, they, are doing a lot of research about kind of what motivates, you know, citizen scientists to um, to engage and in, in their project. And they're, you know, they're doing a lot outside of just looking at the biodiversity in the Serengeti. So I think that's really neat that they kind of take whatever data they have and run with it and see what they can work on and what else they can kind of concentrate on. I'm sorry, I'm just, are there any other questions, comments? Well, that's all I really have today. Um, again, I'm always happy to play with more projects and talk to people about yeah, even if you're an indoors person, you don't have to go out and do this um, to contribute. There's lots of projects that you can do in your home. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. All right, thank you all, <coughs> all so much, especially Megan. Um, for those of you who are still here, I just put the link to our little assessment form. It'd be great if you could fill it out. Um, but yeah, like I said in the chat, I think this is cool. I didn't really know what this was, and now I feel like I could have a conversation about it. Um, I'm gonna try that snapshot Serengeti again and see if I can get something that where I can make out the actual figure of an animal. Oh yeah, um, so spooky. There's actually uh, one of 
Oh, I guess several people at NC State, they have incorporated a citizen science project into their first year writing curriculum. Like, oh, wow. And, yes, and so the, the library does a big portion of it. I, I don't know, I'm still trying to figure out like more details. Um, I don't know if you know hmm. Danica Lewis over there. I know the name, but I don't know if I've met them. Yeah, so uh, yeah, she knows a lot about it. I'm always like, wait, let's talk more about that. And then, yeah, so I need to send her an email and see, because there's, I mean, there's so many different projects, but anyway. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, Audrey asks if you can send out the websites in an email. Could I share your slides to the ULVLC? Yes, they okay. actually have those just like the main four websites listed on the slides. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so if, if you share those with me, Megan, I will put them up when I put the recording up, and then people can go to the ULVLC guide, which is uncg.libguides.com slash ULVLC, um, and so I will have them there. Awesome. So once again, I want to thank everyone for attending, and especially thank Megan for presenting for us today. I'm still working out what we're going to be doing for ULVLC next week. It has become more of a challenge now that there are so many other things to be done. Um, but I do have something potentially in the works. So I'll be sending out an update email either tomorrow or Monday. Um, but that's, that's it for this week and for this session. So thank you all again. And I hope everybody has a lovely Thursday afternoon and maybe does a little bit of citizen science today. All right, y'all, I'm gonna close things out. Thank you so much.